welcome to all the truth seekers that have joined us today. I'm glad that you've decided to join this online community and hope you're ready to inhale some provocative insights that will inspire and change the way that you do business. My name is Mark McKelsey, and I lead the people in the projects that bring you insights, proper trends, and next practices from Global Market Development Center and Retail Tomorrow. For the next hour, this InfoCast will make your lunch hour profitable by demonstrating just how the curiosity and the power of the consumer must be at the center of your strategy. In other words, the way you've done things in the past is not the way your future success will happen. Retailers and brands more than ever must be adaptive and in constant flux in order to connect with evolving populations. So how you respond to this session is important. Without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm coming to you live from Colorado Springs and have Randy Fields, CEO at Park City Group and Repositrack, joining us today from his office in Utah. Today's infocast is about how the COVID-19 crisis has become the black swan event that is forcing companies and entire industries to evaluate how they deal with demand. What the pandemic has exposed to the retail industry to is exactly what stores and e-com sellers do best. They squeeze the supply chain thin in margin and cost. As a result, over the past 60 days, they have exposed their customers to any disruption or blip in predictability can create massive overstocks, leading to frustration and ultimately encouraging a hoarding culture. But more than that, it is also, has also exposed the world's economy to the fact that China is dominant as a global dependent resource to fulfill the need for raw and finished products. With retailers under pressure, especially in the last decade to compete with the rise of e-commerce, chains have put a high focus on optimizing the supply chain and reducing costs, and have done so much to such a point that streamlining, there is little buffer or flexibility left in the system to absorb any kind of interruption. This pandemic illustrates just how tight that string has been pulled and new technologies and a total rethink about the end-to-end -end supply chain must be under scrutiny in order to prevent the shocks experienced since last March. New supply chain technologies will emerge that improve demand planning and signaling and brands have an opportunity to play a major role to improve visibility into the future. We'll talk about more about that today. And by the way, when I say future, I'm not talking about next year or, or the year after. For example, what would happen if a second wave of COVID took place next fall and it was bigger than the crisis we just saw? We've already seen a trade war with China emerge over the past year with tariffs. What if there was an act of terrorism next year? Also, are suppliers ready for potentially major labor disputes if the economy continues to spiral downwards as an after effect of this pandemic? The call for change and improvement is certainly stronger than ever. And there's nothing like a crisis to shake things up. These are all solid reasons why robust trading partner relationships must be deepened today. And it starts with greater transparency and creating the right amount of slack in the line to avoid out of stocks that stores have seen lately, which I believe has been the fuel for channel shifting, loss of consumer loyalty, and ultimately revenue reduction. So here to tell us more, Randy, welcome. Would you kindly let our viewers know a little bit more of what they can learn today? Okay, just a sneak peek because otherwise people won't listen, Mark. But two or three things we think that are gonna happen that are uh, important to keep your eye on. We think that there is in process today a radical shift in how people think about supply chain. Secondly, uh, going forward, supply chain is not primarily going to be based on cost, but we see a number of other elements that will emerge. And frankly, almost every tenant that we've held near and dear to our hearts for the last 20 years about supply chain um, are on their way to the garbage can intellectually. And if you were looking for a byword, uh, the word that will dominate how people think about supply chain, it's control, control, and control. That sounds great, Randy. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So back to our audience, before we get started and dive in, I'd like to remind you that we can take questions during or after the session. Please use the Q&A button, not the chat button at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring those questions and uh, prioritizing them and getting to them at the end of this hour. So please feel free to continue to, to use that throughout this 
next 30 to 40 minute session. So let's get started. Back over to you, Randy. Okay, thank you, Mark. By the way, um, we have seized control of your screens and your computers, and you will be unable to leave this session until you've asked at least one question. So please be thinking about that question so you can go about your work the rest of the day. All right, only kidding, only kidding. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we got to where we are in the supply chain. Let's go to the next slide. And I think it's important to understand what it was that led to the kinds of issues that we're facing today. I think there were two dominant strands of thinking. Frankly, they weren't indeed connected except recently. Let me describe them. About 20 years ago um, or so, you began to read articles in places like the Harvard Business Review and other uh, intellectually important magazines about the importance of what was called just-in-time inventory. Uh, the Japanese call it kanban, which is really a way of thinking. In fact, it means technically billboard or big sign. Um, the idea of kanban was that you would have a company like Toyota that was incredibly efficient at manufacturing. So of course, uh, magazines needing uh, space to be filled sent reporters to try and understand what it was in, in the Toyota supply chain that produced magical results. And it came back and it was summarized in the idea of just-in-time inventory, just-in-time manufacturing. So we've spent an enormous amount of time and money over the last 20 years creating a perverse, we would call it, a perverse form of just-in-time inventory management or just-in-time manufacturing. And we think that that whole strain of thinking has been at the root of what we're experiencing today, which is a near catastrophe and breakdown of the supply chain. On the other hand, simultaneously, US consumers or businesses, we don't know which, there's a chicken and egg issue here, began to focus primarily in terms of their business strategy on the idea of cost, that somehow consumers seemed primarily to care about cost and that that began to dominate our thinking about products, processes, inventories, manufacturing, where things came from, et cetera. Uh, the leader of the charge clearly was Walmart, but that kind of cost-centric thinking um, obviously led to, uh, if not a revolution, a way of thinking about the world across retail and its entire supply chain. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delve into a little bit of detail on each of these because you can tell from the way I structured that. I think that the collision of just-in-time inventory thinking, supply chain thinking, and the idea that the only thing that matters in retail is cost or that it's the primary determinant of consumers, obviously both were misplaced and now we're gonna pay for it for some period of time. So what I really want to do is to decompose the just-in-time inventory theory um, and explain, if, if I can, because it even confuses me and I've given a lot of thought to it, how in the hell did people ever think that it was the right idea? And how did we, in fact, change the idea, morph it, until it represented something that had nothing to do with what Toyota would do? If the CEO of Toyota were, was looking at the supply chain of the average company today, <coughs> he would express, I'm sure in, in very polite Japanese fashion, that we are wildly off the mark. So let's talk a little bit about it. Clearly Toyota has been a world leader, not in thought, but in practice, about how you produce a product that's reasonably priced but extremely high quality and reliability. Toyota doesn't think primarily, incidentally, in terms of the cost. They actually think about the consumer, what the consumer wants by way of reliability and brand integrity. Now, how did it do that? How did it manifest that idea? Well, actually, the primary thing that it thought about wasn't just in time inventory, it actually thought through the lens, and it's gonna come back today, control. Toyota wanted control. 
how did it get control over its manufacturing? Well, that's where this idea of kanban in, in Japanese parlance came to be. Start with, for example, Toyota owns significant pieces of many, if not most, of their suppliers. So they have a seat at the table in terms of how their suppliers behave, not just as a customer, but as an owner. So control dominated the Toyota thinking. How did they manifest this? How did they get how did they get to the point that an assembly underlying assembly plant for an automobile would really only have a few hours at minimum and sometimes a day or so of inventory on hand well they encouraged encourage remember changes what it means when you have an equity position in one of your suppliers they encouraged them to build their manufacturing plants close to a toyota assembly plant what do we mean by close? What if I said a few hundred yards? It was essentially on the same property. So what you had was a small village devoted to the manufacturing of a product so that everyone was close enough together that frankly, the, in -hand, the on hand inventory didn't really matter very much. So the proximity gave them one other thing, control, control, control. And that was really the attitude of Toyota. It wasn't just in time. That was what I call a derivative notion. It wasn't the primary driver. Now, let's take a look at the environment in which this all evolved and see if we can see what over the course of the last 20 years has occurred. Does anybody remember what interest rates were back in the 70s and 80s? Yes, way the hell higher than they are today. So to a certain extent, people hitchhiked, if you will, intellectually, in terms of just-in-time inventory, and utilized the notion of cost of capital to justify why they wanted to reduce the number of days, weeks, months of inventory that they had on hand. So we lived in an environment where the cost of capital was seven, eight, 10, marginal costs of capital if you include equity 15 or 20 so capital was actually pretty expensive it was difficult frequently for people to get the right amount of capital so we had a capital constrained environment at a much higher cost that of course led people down the primrose prep path if you will of just in time inventory can you tell from how i've described this that i think the idea makes sense to a toyota but not to others. Okay, let's go to the next slide because this, this was the one that collided with just-in-time inventory. We all know that generals tend to fight the last war and that's obvious why that happens. It's their experience. And so understanding how today might be different is actually a little bit more intellectually challenging. Not everybody can do it, but it's pretty easy historically to look back and try and understand the environment from which one cometh. So let's think about that for a moment. If we go back to the last uh, recession, the last great recession, 2008 to 10, let's call it, an enormous change occurred at that moment in time in terms of consumers need, need, not necessarily desire, need to find a lower cost way of getting their goods and services. Uh, just as you would expect in a recession, nothing unusual about it. But what happened was that it caused an enormous change in channels. And I want to describe what I mean by that. The pressure economically uh, during that period of time caused consumers to trade down, and usually just one level. Let me, let me see if I can elucidate a little bit about that. If you were, and I'm making this up, uh, a stop and shop buyer in um, in a, the East Coast in let's say Boston, and you found stop and shop because of your economic circumstance to be a little bit too expensive, you would trade down to whatever's just below stop and shop. And if you found that a little bit too expensive, you might trade down to Walmart. And if you were a Walmart shopper and you found Walmart too expensive, you ended up in the dollar store channel. In other words, we think people self-sorted themselves back in 2008-10 into a channel that gave them the price 
uh, that they were in fact looking for, that they could afford. Well, that caused people to change, not just short term, but frankly, lots of people just changed their shopping behavior. But retailer after retailer has focused over the last 10 years as we came out of the recession, as if the predominant determinant of where a shopper shopped was price. We happen to think that that was an egregious error. Sure, there are shoppers who shop for price. They're cherry pickers for the most part. So the consequence is, in focusing on the cherry pickers who are price buyers, you create problems for your regular customers who are looking for something that's very different. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But we think the war was won in terms of pricing back in 2008-10 at retail. And the consequence of that was a new war emerged. Strangely enough, nobody started fighting that war yet. We think it's the war of on-shelf availability. And I'll explain a little bit why we think that war is one that cannot afford to be lost. The alternative to on-shelf availability is to go online, to go to the dreaded Amazon um, and lose your customers forever. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Well, if the retailer is focused on cost because he thinks that's how you either grow your share or keep your customers, again, we think it was not entirely, but substantially misplaced. You begin to push that down from the shelf all the way through your supply chain. So you begin to focus inside the supply chain on which vendor can give me the best price. How do I increase my volume with that particular vendor? so that he'll give me an even better price. There goes second sourcing, there goes protection of your supply chain in favor of the idea of getting lower costs from higher volumes from a single provider. And ultimately what we believe this did was to do what we call get away from just in time to WFA, way far away supply chains. The idea that products come from, let's say China, is almost unimaginable. How about this? About 25 years ago, please don't hold me to the number, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of canners in America, people who put things into cans and sold them at retail. Just for fun, go Google the number of canners left in America. By and large, they've all left. I believe there's less than 10 in the United States today, down from hundreds. And I could go on and on and on about we, how we have taken our supply chain and literally moved it offshore at great distance. That's the opposite of just-in-time. It's the absolute opposite of just-in-time inventory. Just-in-time requires proximity. You can't separate those two ideas. So now we operate in a world that we call WFA, way far away. And we think that era is rapidly coming to an end. Let's take a look at the next slide. So what does that produce, this, this confluence, if you will, of the idea of just-in-time lean inventories and a cost consciousness on the part of supply chain uh, participants and practitioners that focuses simply on the idea of have as little as possible and make it as far away as you can. Well, two things. Resilience is absolutely, utterly gone, completely gone. And we see that today if you go into a supermarket and you find, interestingly, that many things are in short supply. But here's what else is interesting. There's another side of this. If you take a look at the supermarket channel and if we and I know primarily the people on this call are not in the food area, but let's, let's pick that since without food, you wouldn't have supermarkets, right? So let's talk about the food supply chain. The food supply chain actually now branches at the farm. So you have farmers whose primary market, if you will, is retail food, supermarkets. You have other farmers who at the end of their supply chain primarily service and provide food for food service. So where we are today is food service has been shut down by and large. 
supermarkets are uh, chock-a-block with customers and lack product. So if you assume it's the same supply chain, meaning it all begins with some farmer growing something, look what's happened. Massive overcapacity on one hand, where people are pouring milk out and killing little piglets, etc. And then the other hand, inside supermarkets, what we've done is to make ourselves, if you will, um, food poorer than we would like to be at the moment. Simultaneously, oversupply and undersupply. How's that for a supply chain gone awry? Now, on top of all of that, a fundamental rule of manufacturing security has always been, and supply chain security, is you don't single source anything. Why would you do that? Why would you be entirely dependent on a supplier for anything? And the places this shows up are extraordinary. I'm sure there is at least one participant in this phone call who's had the sad experience in the last few months that they have one little part, one little thing that's needed to assemble some other bigger thing. And that one little thing that might only cost a nickel or a dime comes from, yes, China. And it's sitting on a dock somewhere, so an entire manufacturing line is shut down. The retailers who would be buying that product can't sell it. So you have out of stocks as a function of a supply chain that single sourced itself into, frankly, oblivion. So the price we're paying today to me is extraordinary. We've given up resilience and we did a deal with the devil. And the devil said, I'll get your costs down but you're gonna give me all of your resilience and you're going to give me a degree of dependence on a long, long geographically dispersed supply chain. It was a bad deal. It was a genuinely bad deal. Let's take a look at the next slide. So I think there's a whole variety of things that we're facing and we're early in this. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let's talk about where it could go given where we uh, currently find ourselves. I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that the supply chain now has a degree of fragility, which means risk. Fragility and risk are synonymous in supply chain. But guess what you're about to have? Well, we're gonna make it worse. You're going to find countries around the world where we have distributed our supply chains, decide that some of the products that they're exporting they can't afford to export because they're trying to protect their domestic supply chain. An example of that is PPE products right now, where country after country is saying, why should I send them to the US? I need them here. So now you're gonna have shortages that were uh, at one point not noticeable because of the supply chain length, about to be exacerbated because countries are gonna put export controls um, on a whole variety of products. Let me give you an example. The largest importer of rice in the world is, you can't make this up, the Philippines. So what happens if countries like the US who find themselves at some point in time in a shortage position for products or other countries suddenly say, we're not going to export rice at the same rate, we will restrict it. Well, that leads to hunger in the Philippines. So we've created this network of interdependency that literally, I don't think very far from now, let's say next six to 12 months, will bring 100 million people in the world to the brink of starvation. Um, it's clear to me that that was done as a result of uh, inadequate planning in our real supply chains. What else are we gonna have? Well, since this is not a unique thought, <clears throat> we're going to see many, many suppliers wake up and go, oh my God, this long distance, uh, way far away supply chain, as Randy calls it, uh, needs to change. So we're going to localize what we do. We're going to bring it back. Well, guess what that's going to do? Over the intermediate term, that's going to create bottlenecks because the capacity isn't here. Why isn't the capacity here? because we exported it. We sent our jobs and our capacity outside the US. Oh, and as if that isn't enough, there's one more thing. It's the bullwhip. So let's talk about what we're about to experience for suppliers to retail. Suppose you were a, um, 
a retailer and uh, you sell toilet paper, pick that one because everybody seems fixated on it. So what happens with toilet paper? Well, for a reason that none of us know, but I'm old enough to remember when Johnny Carson went on TV one night and said there's going to be a toilet paper shortage, the next day, there was no toilet paper to be purchased in America. There was no shortage per se, but there was a perception of shortage and that led to a real shortage. So we can probably assume that's true for toilet paper. So you go into a supermarket, you go to buy toilet paper, you notice that most of what you want is gone. You kind of think, wow, must be something going on with toilet paper. I'll buy more than I need. All right. So let's follow that chain up to the buyer of toilet paper at that retailer. What does he do? Suppose his normal order is, I'm making this up obviously, 100 cases of toilet paper. So he places his order for 100 cases. His supplier is seeing this all around America. So his supplier puts him on allocation. So instead of 100 cases, he ships him 50 cases, let's say. Oh, okay. Well, this guy wasn't uh, just didn't fall off a turnip truck, this buyer. He knows what to do. The demand for toilet paper is now going up. So he's not going to place an order for 100, expecting to get 50. He's going to place an order for 200, hoping to get 100. Whoops. And everybody's doing that. So what's in the process of occurring is, because we see this, we're in this business, we're seeing people arbitrarily increase their order size because the fill rate has fallen dramatically. Result, there's a whole bunch of phantom orders out there. And once the supermarket has so much toilet paper, they're storing it in their CEO's office, you're going to see those orders backed off and canceled. That's the other side of the bullwhip. We don't think we're too far from that. Let's go to the next slide. So what does the future look like given this mess? Well, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that our thinking is that the entire supply chain is about to be revamped. The focus will be on speed. And I'm gonna come back to an interesting idea, something that we call visibility. And increasingly the avoidance of out of stocks, which has not been the primary focus of either retailers, frankly, or CPG companies supplying retailers. So the operative word, as I mentioned in our introduction, is the idea of control. That means we expect people will want to control their supply chain's resilience. Every aspect of their supply chain will now be dominated by the idea of not being at effect from the supply chain, but being in control of the supply chain. So here's some examples. If I have two choices of supply chain partners, one of them is in China and the other is in Toledo, I think I'm gonna take the guy in Toledo. And I know I'm gonna pay a little bit more for that. Okay, what else? Well, what if the guy in Toledo has a problem? What if his workers get COVID? Or what if one of his suppliers fails? Well, I can't depend on him. So I'm gonna go back to something that, that almost everyone did 50 years ago. I'm gonna multi-source. I'm gonna have a second source of supply. And I might even contract with my primary supplier to force him to find for me a second sourcing. So you're gonna see all kinds of interesting business arrangements between suppliers and their customers over the idea of second and third sourcing. And yes, you'll pay a higher price. Of course you will. Now, let's go to the next level. The cost of capital, call me crazy, is essentially zero. How long will it stay that way, Randy? Well, let me give you an economic view that we have. And I apologize because it's a bit of a bearish view and I hate to do this, but you have to have a, a starting assumption about the world in which you're gonna be working. Uh, we run a, our own modeling for what we see so that we can help our customers plan, but we are not optimists about the economy. We believe that we've done 
very substantial structural damage in shutting the economy down. I won't argue about whether or not that was a good or bad decision, but it is the decision and here we are. We believe that the first step in this recession, or whatever it's called, the first step is what you've already seen. Uh, we're guessing that unemployment U6, which is the number that we track, we think U6 will go up to 31 or 32 percent. You have to think about what a number of unemployed at 31 or 32 percent means for the society. That in and of itself will cause a second wave of consumer fear and concern that will suppress consumer spending for some period of time. So the numbers that we run, just looking at, at possible growth rates for the economy coming out of this, we think it's six, seven, or eight years until employment gets back to where it was in February of this year. In other words, we're in a long-term suppressed economic environment from a growth perspective. What that implies, however, is that, and by the way, round two of this is just beginning. Round two is when a contraction of the economic system feeds back into the financial system. And the Fed has done a miraculous job of making credit available, but you cannot push on a string, as they say. You cannot get people to borrow in the face of bad business outlook. So you're gonna see a huge contraction of capital spending. You're going to see as this, as this wiggles its way back into the financial system, a wave of defaults, a wave of bankruptcies, and further depression, if you will, of both business sentiment and consumer sentiment. Oh God, Randy, it's sure fun to listen to you. But nevertheless, that's where we think we are. The consequence as it goes back into the financial system is sort of like a bell ringing, then comes back into the economic system, is that interest rates and therefore cost of capital is going to be at these kinds of levels for years to come, years. So what's that mean? Carry more inventory. The cost of carrying it is close to zero. It reduces your risk of a disruption and a massive sales problem like many companies are experiencing today. Well, what does the need, what, what happens when you need more inventory and you carry more inventory? Duh, there's gonna be a great demand for warehouse space. And it can change your business strategy. Instead of other um, characteristics from a marketing messaging perspective, we think you're going to see people give guaranteed supply contracts and it'll be the opposite of a, a take or pay. It will be, we will guarantee you get it or we will pay you. So we think the ability to control your supply chain will lead to a really interesting competitive advantage for suppliers. Let's go to the next slide. This one is really mind bending. We believe there's a structural shift that's been going on that we think now uh, will manifest itself in a couple of interesting ways. Retailers have for the last God knows how long, many, many years, been under economic pressure to bring their costs in line because remember, they think that their customers, we don't argue this is true, they think their customers really only care about price. Therefore, they've delabored their stores they've taken every cost they can find out of the system. Well, what's that mean? Well, if you're a CPG company and you sell 25 SKUs to a retail store, so you're 25 SKUs on the shelf going through a warehouse, his warehouse, guess what? You've got a store manager with 50,000 SKUs, you're not gonna get much attention. And more interestingly, if I were a CPG supplier, I would ask myself this question every day. How much did I sell today? Literally, every shelf, every store, every SKU, how much did I sell? And we can't find any CPG company that can answer that question. What they think is, well, I'm not sure how much I sold at retail. I shipped some stuff today, and I shipped some stuff last week, and I shipped some stuff last month but I don't have any damn idea how much I sold. And our argument is this, every CPG company, 
is going to have to become what we call a virtual retailer. Why? The retailer can't pay as much attention to you as you would like. If you think the transaction is done when you've shipped it to his DC and then you get paid, you're wrong. In fact, we don't think it's a viable strategy for CPG companies. So what we're suggesting and we're seeing a great deal of, primarily from startups, is that companies will want to get control of their supply chain end to end. Where does it begin? It begins with the consumer. It begins with that man or woman pushing a cart down the aisle, taking things off the shelf. You have to control what's on that shelf. You have to stock it. You want that shelf. You will begin to think of retailers as real estate, as landlords. So we see an interesting and important shift. I know this sounds crazy from warehouse back to DSD, direct store delivery, where you can be in complete control of your product set. And ultimately what we think that means is you have to have visibility to the shelf. And we're amazed at how many of our customers have been waking up to that with us over the last, frankly, year and accelerated during COVID, where they've asked us to provide them Store by store, skew by skew, visibility as to what's happening. How much did I sell today of that skew and what store? That gives you future demand planning capability so you can plan better what your supply chain should be bringing in the back door of your manufacturing plant. So we believe that at the end of the day, owning that shelf, controlling it likely from a DSD perspective, but under any circumstance, having visibility to what's on the shelf, what's selling store by store, puts you in control of your destiny. Ask yourself the question, what else has changed between the retailer and the CPG company dramatically over the last 15 years? How about this? He became your competitor. If you're a CPG company, your foremost competitor today is not another brand. It's private label. It's all over. So what that means is that if you're not watching your out of stocks on the shelf at every retail store every single day, your retailer doesn't care as much about restocking you as he does restocking his private label brand. So you're gradually liquidating your brand equity in favor of the private label product. Do this, just for imagine, uh, just imagine for a moment, you walk into a retail store today, and out of stocks are driving it, we believe it's at its extreme right now, but it's still the mentality of a shopper. But we can see it in extremis, which is today's out of stock world. So you walk over to the toilet paper aisle, and you are a dedicated, I will never use anything other than Charmin toilet paper person. Sorry, dude, no Charmin. Hmm. So Interesting question. Do you do without toilet paper? Not likely. So what do you do? You see president's toilet paper. You say, well, all right, any port in the storm. And you try it and you take it home and you say, well, you know what? This is 50% less. They have it in stock and it's not so bad. You just lost Mr. Sharman, a customer, likely a customer for life. Our argument is right now, every CPG company has to know every single day, every single SKU, every single store, where are you out of stock and what are you doing to fix it? Control, control, control. So, uh, by the way, we've measured this. We've had customers who tell us, oh, you know, DSD is too expensive. Oh, really? Well, let me describe expensive. Uh, we have an interesting case study that, that occurred with us, sadly, about a year ago. We had a DSD uh, supplier that was supplying many thousands of stores, and they concluded that DSD had too much cost associated with it. So they shifted their strategy from DSD and control to the warehouse. So we got to measure what it mattered to them. It was actually over a 50% decline in sales, 
Now, routinely, we see 20 to 30% decreases in sales, or the other side of it, 20 to 40% increases in sales when people go from the warehouse to DSV. So we see a shift, even if it looks more expensive, remember, you're trading costs for control, and you're eventually gonna liquidate your brand if private label takes your customers. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, by the way, good news, I think. If we are correct, let me give you some stats. They're horrifying on, on the one hand. Uh, the only economic forecasting that we think is, is reliable and one that we would consider using, other than our own, comes from the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. They're actually pretty good. Not as good as when Alice Ribbon was there, but they're still pretty good. So if you look at the CBO, and they're estimating, now this is not U6, this is just your headline unemployment rate. Here's what they think. They think by the end of 2021, now let's remember that date, end of 2021, almost 18 months from now, that the unemployment rate will have declined, declined to 9%. Wrap your brain around that. It will have declined to 9%. Remember, at the peak of the last Great Recession, which was horrific, they called it a once-in-a-lifetime event, it peaked at 10. So 18 months from now, after a struggling recovery, assuming COVID has gone away, don't bet on that, Unemployment will have declined from its peak in the 20s, the way they measure it, down to a 9% rate. That is not going to be a stunning environment. So it means the tight labor market that we'd experience is going to change dramatically. So if you're ever going to go back to the idea of DSD, the labor market favors that right now. Okay, next slide. So what do we think? Speed matters, visibility to the shelf matters. If you cannot see every store, every SKU, every day right now, you're out of control of your business and you're gonna pay the price. It's really that simple. We think in summary, there's gonna be a bunch of new winners, many old losers, and that the two key ingredients here are speed and, and visibility. Let's go to the next slide, we'll show you some of the things and it's interesting because th this is the kinds of problems that we solve for our customers. And it's just like the, this is the list of stuff that people have asked us to work on in the last uh, six or eight weeks. Out of stocks, up, upper left-hand corner. I can simply tell you that the winners and losers of the next 10 years will be the people who put price aside, price aside, and focus on being in stock, in stock not out of stock, even when the COVID problem is behind us. Uh, people don't seem to be very good at ordering and, and keeping their stock levels appropriate. So we're finding a lot of interest from people in, in working with us about, hey, can you help me get my orders right? Because I'm, by the way, anybody who has overstocks also has understocks. They go together, it's bad forecasting. So we've had to fix that a lot of times. That seems to be a hot button right now with our customer set. Um, this idea of visibility that I talk about is, if you said, just give us one thing that we should be thinking about, it's, it's use somebody like us. I'm not gonna tout us, but we're good at this. You've gotta have visibility to the shelf. You have to have that. You cannot rely on the retailer to take care of your products. You have to be on the shelf, store by store, skew by skew, day by day. You have to see it, you have to know where the problems are, and you have to find a way to address the problems. Um, we've developed a whole methodology for helping people find local sourcing. The, the China gig is done, bring it back. Uh, we've, we've actually developed some ways to help people find alternative suppliers. Um, and then overall, the risk of suppliers now is going up. So there's a, a need to do more due diligence. We're finding a big demand from our customers on the idea of I need to do due diligence so I don't go all the way down the road with a prospective supplier only to find he's not somebody I can do business with. He doesn't have enough insurance. 
He doesn't have the financial capability. He failed his GFSI on it, whatever it would be. But we've never in our history experienced the kind of demand that we're seeing now for the sorts of supply chain services that, that we've been providing. So I think the good news is lots of people are thinking about supply chain and what's broken and how they address it, not short term, but structurally. All right, I'll shut up and let you ask questions. Thank you, Randy. We really appreciate that. And uh, that is certainly great information and relevant to many of our suppliers and even some of the retailers that are on our call today. We do have a few questions and uh, looks like we still have about 10 minutes until the top of the hour. So let me go ahead and, uh, and ask a few of those. So great call out in the beginning. And uh, again, even as we're to our audience, even as we're answering questions, please continue to to push those through to us. Uh, Randy, Amy is asking, when demand patterns normalize, what do you think the new reality will look like for retailers as they manage their omni-channel strategies? Yeah, that's uh, a great, great question. The omni-channel strategy is difficult, to say the least, because you have two different kinds of demands being made against one set of inventories. And it's hard to know where it's going to be. For sure, when people can't go out, they're going to order more online. Is that permanent? No, of course not. Um, but as things loosen, you're going to find that, and if we were guessing, we would guess 25 to 30% of the uptick in the grocery channel from online ordering, pickup, et cetera, will stick. However, it's a catastrophe. Mm. We're kidding ourselves. Uh, we run some numbers, and here's what we've seen. 24% of the orders can be filled as placed. Now, there is no business in the world that can have a 75 or 76% error rate and survive. So the technology is clunky. It annoys the hell out of consumers to get five or six texts or, or uh, messages or phone calls saying, I don't have this, I've got that. It's not just the problem of COVID. This problem existed well before. So we don't think the world is ready for the level of onlineness that everybody's thinking. It's not a permanent shift. Randy, Tim is asking, as a growing supplier, what steps should I take to capitalize on changes to retail and the supply chain? Change your distribution strategy to direct store delivery. Simple, simple, simple. If you can say to a retailer, I'm going to be on the shelf, I'm going to provide the labor, I don't have to stop at the back door the way I have before, I don't want to ship to your warehouse, I want to take it over and be in control of my destiny. Virtually every retailer will welcome that. Um, and the consequence is you'll gain distribution as a young growing supplier and you will have control of your destiny. Nothing's better than that. We have time for one more question. Henry is asking, Randy, when you say a supplier should quote unquote, think like a retailer or become a virtual retailer, uh, what does that mean for my business? Well, it really means that the sale isn't a sale to the retailer. It means the sale is a sale to the consumer. So is the consumer, it's actually pretty simple. Is the consumer wandering around the retailer's warehouse looking for products? Does he drive a forklift over to get his product? No, he's in a store. He wants a store experience. He wants to see your product displayed without uh, being out of stock. If you have five SKUs and two of them are gone, the others are gonna be purchased, sadly, likely private label or by, uh, by a consumer to your competitors. So literally just think, what's the consumer experience? And how do I stay on the shelf, in stock, all of the time? Out of stocks are the bane of the existence of both the retailer and, frankly, increasingly CPG. Well, Randy, we are out of time. But, Randy, thank you once again for being part of this, not only as a longstanding GMDC member, but certainly for delivering the insights, the relevant insights for many of our viewers today. And, um, please note that we're recording this and this will be available to many people who have perhaps missed this as well. So thanks, thanks again for your time today. Fun time. Thanks, Mark. 
If this is your first time experiencing a GMDC Infocast, I'd like to make sure that you're aware that this session, and as mentioned previously, all previous Infocasts are recorded and can be viewed on the archive tab on gmdcconnect.org, along with a schedule to register, register for future ones. We t uh, during the COVID crisis, we've been hosting these on a weekly basis, so please feel free to stay tuned. Many more relevant ones coming up through June and uh, the summer schedule will be filling up soon as well. I'd encourage you to get involved with GMDC Retail tomorrow and become a member today if you already haven't. This is just a small sample of what members have access to. GMDC is a nonprofit retail-owned association that helps companies like you connect to people and opportunities in the general merchandise, health, beauty, wellness, and self-care industries. For more information, please contact me at markm at gmdc.org. I'd love to help you find opportunities and get your company exposed to high profile executives that can truly change your business. Thanks for joining us today. We hope the rest of your week is as productive as this hour has been and have a really great long weekend. Take care.